And now joining us from London on Book TV is Simon Jenkins. Here's a little bit about our guest before we get started uh, in our chat with him. He served as editor of the Evening Standard newspaper as well as editor of the Times of London as well. He served as a columnist for that paper. He also worked with The uh, Economist as political editor. He's currently a Huffington Post blogger. He's former chairman of the National Trust here in England, and he is the author of several books. He's written about the Falkland Wars. He's written about newspapers, imperialism, race relations, government policy. Simon Jenkins, the last, or three of your latest books include Churches, Margaret Thatcher, and A History of England. What's, that's rather an eclectic mix of topics. I mean, I've got two totally different sides of my activity and my, almost my personality. One is I'm a political columnist with The Guardian, actually, not Huffington Post, much though I love them. Um, uh, but um, I've written about politics all my life, and I've been involved in, in political controversy. Politics is my interest. Totally different side is, is architecture. I started off with London architecture. I wrote two books on London buildings. Um, I am fascinated by architecture generally. America as well as Britain. Uh, I went on to write books about church, English churches, English houses, um, Welsh houses and churches. So I mean, I, I find I spend roughly half my time worrying about the environment and buildings and landscape and that sort of thing. The other half worrying about politics. I tend to keep them apart. Which one brings you mo more pleasure to write about? I think probably architecture. I mean, I, I just, I just, uh, I just get inside buildings in a curious way. But um, the book I'm working on now is about English landscape. It's called England's Hundred Best Views, and it's really a, an attempt to look at what constitutes a, a beautiful view, literally what, what, what the eye sees when it looks at landscape. And um, that, that is, I mean, I'm now in love with landscape, and I've sort of moved on from buildings. But I find I can fall in love with subjects like that very easily, and it becomes becomes a kind of a ruling obsession. So now I'm very concerned. I'm chairman of the National Trust, which is concerned with places, um, beautiful places, beautiful buildings, beautiful coastline. Um, and these two things sort of merge into one. I'm very, very concerned with the threat to landscape, the threat to the countryside, the threat to the coastline. Um, I'm concerned with saving it, and I'm writing about it. So that all is all bound up in one thing. Now, the National Trust, is that mm. private? Is that a government agency? Nothing to do with the government whatsoever. <laughs> it's, it's Britain's it's one of the world's biggest charities. I mean, it's huge. Um, it, it, we own about 350 houses open to the public. Um, there's, a, there's a National Trust in America. We're good friends of theirs, but it's much smaller. Um, no, we own, we own a huge estate. Um, we have about sort of 600,000 um, acres of land. We own much of the Lake District, um, Exmoor, um, much of the Cotswolds. Um, it, it's, it's a big charity. It's been running for about 120 years. And, um, and it's a, just a big organization. It's got 4 million members. And how long have you been chairman, and how long will you be chairman? I've been chairman for four years, and I've got two to go. It's a fixed term, but um, it's great fun. Mm -hmm. Well, Simon Jenkins, you mentioned that you also write about politics, served as a newspaper editor here in London. A um, couple of current topics mm. tie into your books. Recently, there was a vote in the <coughs> Falkland Islands, and you've written about the Falkland mm. Islands. Ninety-eight percent of the uh, islanders wanted to retain their British sovereignty. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, no, Max Hastings and I wrote a book about the, the Falklands War back in 82 when it was fought. Um, it's very curious because we decided to do it thinking there wouldn't be a war. Max was going down there and he was on the boat and I was sitting in London and going back was the fort of Washington as well. Um, it was one of those crazy wars that very few countries get to fight. Relatively soon over, it was a triumph, it worked. Um, it was a very, very strange affair. It's one of the last naval battles. In fact, Max and I still sell the book in Annapolis in America, because all the students in Annapolis have to read this book on the Falklands War, because it was the last naval battle. Um, but it was, it was a controversial war. Um, it, it, it entrenched this kind of crazy colony uh, on this, this group of islands off, off the coast of Argentina. Um, it's very difficult to justify, but when you've got a group of nationals who believe passionately that they're British, it's difficult to abandon them. What did that war do to Margaret Thatcher's career? It saved her life. I have no question about it. I mean, quite a lot of people think otherwise, but I am in no doubt at all she would have lasted another six months had it not been for that war or another year. Um, uh, it totally rescued her. Um, she became, she went from being a, 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 a factional politician in England, really in trouble, in a deep recession, um, very unpopular, 
uh, fighting wars with everybody, apart from the Argentinians. Uh, it just turned her into an iron lady. She became a hero. I mean, you know, Reagan befriended her. Um, Gorbachev befriended her. She, she was a serious, the last British politician on the world stage, really. Um, justified or not, it, there's no doubt it made her. Simon Jenkins, one of your recent books, Thatcher and Sons, A Revolution in Three Acts. Who are the sons? The sons were, were John Major, who was the prime minister who followed Margaret Thatcher when she was defenestrated in 1990, um, and, uh, and then Tony Blair, and then Gordon Brown, um, who were Thatcherites. I mean, they were all basically pursuing the same approach to the public sector that she was. They were Reaganites, there's no question about it. Um, Gordon Brown less so, particularly now we know how much he was, he was, he was spending. Um, but in that sense, so were the Americans. I mean, th th this, was a, this was a revolution that began in 76, 78, with, with um, the end of Labour and the beginning of Thatcher. Um, and it, it, it spread across the world. The, the, the belief that finally the welfare consensus is over, that we've got to be, you've got to be tough on public spending, you've got to be um, you know, sort of ruthless with money, money supply, these things. Um, and it, it, it became associated with Margaret Thatcher. But uh, part of my book is about how Blair and Brown, who were great buddies at the time, realized that she was right. There was no point in pretending that she was wrong. And they turned the Labour Party around to pursue Thatcherite policies, privatization, and so on. Um, pursued it in power. Um, <clears throat> eventually, it went off the rails because they spent too much. Um, but they weren't alone in that. Gordon Brown was comptroller, wasn't he? For he, was tra he was chancellor of the Exchequer and throughout, throughout the Blair years, yeah. Right, and in that position, what was he able to control? And he, 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 he did, the, the, the British economy was under some sort of control for the first sort of five, six years of the, of the, the then Labour government. Um, but gradually they started spending and borrowing, borrowing and spending, borrowing and spending much more, as exactly like the, the American government, I may say. Um, and by 2007, eight, it was out of control in the same way you, you experienced in America. Um, uh, I think, to be honest, Margaret Thatcher would not have done that. I think she'd have watched it more closely. I'm not a great enthusiast for her, but she was somebody who watched discipline in those terms. Um, and what happened right across the democracies of Europe and America in, in, in 2005, 6, 7, 8 was reckless. We now know. And we're paying the price. Simon Jenkins, in 1979, when Margaret Thatcher was first elected, were you, did you vote for her? Did, were you a supporter of hers? I can't remember. <laughs> I, 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 a, a journalist tend not to be particularly ardent, enthusiast, partisans. I think probably in 79 I would have voted for her. I think I probably would. Um, you know, those are terrible times. Britain was in a real mess in the 70s. It, it did not look a happy country. Um, the, the theory that we were ungovernable, you know, people, the unions seemed out of control. Um, it was a terrible time in the 70s. And she really did stop it. She didn't stop it until after the Falklands. But I mean, by then, I mean, she did stop it. And by the end of the 80s, Britain was looking pretty good. It was very smug. Um, we thought we were doing everything right. Um, we were one of the weakest countries in Europe at the beginning of the seven, at the beginning of the 80s, and by the end of the 80s, we were one of the most sort of potent and um, prosperous countries in Europe. It was a real turnaround, and it was it was her doing. You also wrote a book about the Tories and the nationalization mm. of the economy mm. via the Tories. How did that? How, how did those two things? Most people don't put those two things together. Well, m my sort of critique of, of Thatcherism really was that, it was that it was on the one hand um, a belief in the private sector in reducing taxes, in setting enterprise free, but at the same time the public sector of the economy uh, was ruthlessly centralized. So you had, a, you, had a, you had a crippling of local government power. I mean the cities were stripped of power, um, they were stripped of revenue, Everything that, that, that happened in Britain in the public sector happened through the central government, and that's what I call the nationalization of Britain. So it was an ironic use of the term. But it's as if in America all states' rights had been abandoned, all city mayors had been abolished. It was completely um, a centralized economy, rather like France used to be. Um, and I think it was deleterious. And uh, great institutions like the National Health Service, which was a sort of famous British religion almost, um, now in a terrible mess because it's run from central government. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a not, a, not an enthusiast for central government. Overall, how would you describe David Cameron's performance and the current state of the British economy? It's in a very difficult way. I mean, all Western economies are. Um, they borrowed too much. Um, they spent too much. Cutting spending nowadays is very, very difficult politically. Um, it is, it is, uh, it's in a bad way. Um, 
I thought Cameron was good when he came in. Um, he's having a terrible time now. Um, there's no